Thank you, Priyank, uh, and thanks, Arita, for uh, organizing this uh, uh, stage uh, on a wonderful Wednesday evening. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I know how many participants do we have today. We have 40 uh, of three are panelists, so 37 and counting uh, people spending useful time from your professional lives uh, in their in your work and spending time here. Uh, I'll do my best to uh, create value uh, that Arita is. Uh, uh, creating through this platform uh, for its uh, for the attendees on this webinar uh, and like Priyank was saying if there are any questions uh, we will we will pause at relevant sections during this presentation uh, and uh, I'll be super happy to answer your questions uh, I look forward to an active uh, uh, participation uh, provide provide knowledge about what I know and also share from your experiences so I really am excited about this uh, so moving on uh, uh, a little bit about myself, uh, adding a little bit uh, more context uh, from what uh, Priyank mentioned at the beginning. Uh, I've been in the industry 30 years uh, uh, now, uh, of which I've spent 25 years in product engineering. Uh, my last experience was as uh, VP of engineering at Smarsh. Uh, it's a Portland-based uh, company headquartered. Uh, and uh, over the years, I, I worked in this company 18 years. Before that, I was in a payments uh, startup. Uh, and then before that, I was at TCS. Uh, but over the experience uh, of 18 years in this company, uh, I had the opportunity to create four product lines uh, and uh, all of them were in the broad area of enterprise information archiving. Um, it's really about uh, how do you archive all forms of electronic communication uh, and, and it's really meant for from very small enter companies, say 15 to 20 employees, all the way to the largest of banks say 250,000 employees. So the whole uh, the whole landscape of the industry and and the, the the best part, at least from my perspective, was I saw the evolution of the industry from its infancy back in the early early century uh, to to where it is today. And uh, when I uh, as part of my experience, I was able to see the product go to the top of the Gartner Magic Quadrant, uh, where we were leaders ahead of companies like Proofpoint and Microsoft in that space. So that was a proud achievement. And all my lessons was basically from working there. Uh, and I, I wish to share what I learned from there. Uh, early in uh, 2021, uh, I, I decided to uh, take a step away from uh, core engineering uh, as an employee, uh, but really wanted to create a platform where I could share my knowledge uh, with the broader industry. And I founded uh, growhappily.in. Uh, and that's it's, it's a three week old uh, company, uh, which has uh, as many employees as one, which is myself. Um, and the picture is on the left. Uh, and, and what I really want to do uh, is to uh, help uh, organizations, teams uh, uh, to create transformative leadership. Uh, at, at level one and level two, uh, engineering levels, uh, because I, I, I strongly believe that being able to create the right cultural mindsets at level one and level two of technology leadership really transforms companies because it, it, you are building the gr organization ground up. This was my experience. I, I, I was able to see that really work and I, I strongly believe in that. Uh, and from there, it, it drives my Ikigai, which is really uh, the, the purpose, my core purpose uh, as, as a people tech leader, uh, my my perspective is that it is it becomes your moral imperative if you are a people leader of technology it becomes your moral imperative uh, to create growth for yourself and as you grow uh, you create opportunities for your team to grow and and with that the organization grows so it, it's a it's a great positive way to influence everything uh, and my goal right now is uh, over over the decade or how many ever years i can i can actively be engaged influence uh, a thousand managers so that I can positively influence 10,000 engineers to have great careers. So that's really what I wish to do. Uh, and uh, uh, my journey starts from here. Uh, so that's where uh, this is. This is my background. Uh, so getting to the specific topic, uh, I have posted a survey, Priyank. Uh, you can uh, send it to the team here. Uh, the, uh, the, there will be two questions. It won't be a long survey, so don't be scared. Uh, just uh, they're all single choice. You don't. Have, it's uh, there are multiple options, but then pick the choice that you think is the most relevant. Okay, and if you think multiple are relevant, pick up the one that's most relevant. Go ahead and answer the survey, please. I just shared it to okay. all the attendees via the chat window. Okay. Uh, 
if anyone hasn't received it uh, you can you can respond back in the chat window or type it in the q and a section and then please feel free to participate in the it's a very straightforward survey so it should take you no more than 30 seconds to respond As you are responding, please, please feel free to watch the pie grow here. I give it maybe another minute for all the responses to come in. Okay, I think I have more than three quarters of the team uh, responding. You can continue to respond, uh, but uh, I, if you can see uh, the response, uh, as you can see, many of you, broadly, uh, many of you think uh, agile transformation is primarily about culture. A few of you think it's process. Uh, some of you think it's team organization. Uh, it, but it's it's the the real answer is true for all of the above. But the most impactful is culture. And I agree with most of you. Uh, Agile transformation is fundamentally about culture. And that's why you use the term transformation, right? Because transforming culture is the hardest part. And if we can focus on culture, we can get it right. The purpose of this uh, webinar would be to really understand what that culture means. And I will, I will get into the details. The second one was, from your experience, many of you have been involved in Agile organizations. Where do you see your challenges? And this is very instructive. And, and it's exactly the purpose of my survey. As you can see, you will see challenges from across the organization. There will not be one team that will not have resistance. And this is this bears testimony to the fact that it is a cultural transformation, right? You cannot say if, if you if you are transforming team members, you will become agile or lead or managers. It goes across the organization. And that's why when you think of agile transformation, don't look at it as, as a cultural transformation for a group of people, it's for the whole organization. You need to go all the way from the front to the back of the organization to really make a difference. So thanks for all the responses. I think it, it does uh, validate my assumptions. And I hope that this survey is helpful to provide you the insight on what transformation actually implies. Uh, I'll switch back to the deck. Um, Priyanki, everybody's able to see the deck here? Yes. Yes. OK. So with, with the survey results and being data driven uh, in this day of uh, data, uh, let's let's move to the core agenda. So. The way I, I would like to structure today's discussion is to really talk about uh, agile transformation as a culture. And if you see the, the glacier on the left, uh, culture is, is fundamentally uh, a, a glacier, right? Think about it like an iceberg, where at the very bottom you have values, right? Think about values as uh, the values when you con consistently repeat things, when, when you apply principles, which is in the middle, apply them consistently. Right, that impacts your values. But if you really see on a day-to-day -day basis what you will see uh, in at your workplace, in any any agile organization, any organization that claims to be agile, what you will see will be behaviors. Right, those behaviors are a reflection of the principles. Those are the rules, and the rules in turn are based on values. So what I what I want to do today is uh, help this team, uh, help all of you attendees understand agile from its principles. Right, and knowing very well that principles are the codified rules. Think about them like the commandments. Uh, and what's for the anti-patterns in the behaviors? Because it is the behavior that will, what you can see, right? Principles and values you cannot see. But as you watch the behaviors, look for where the anti-patterns are. And from the anti-patterns, once you are aware of the anti-patterns, you can use them to correct your behaviors. And as you keep working on the behaviors, 
and, and apply it consistently, you will, you will be influencing the values. The problem with values is it's very deep, it's not visible, right? And therefore, as, as practitioners, we need to work at principles, watch the behaviors, and by being consistent, in, influence the values. Okay, so this is this is very key. It's a it's a very fundamental aspect of any behavioral science uh, work, whether it is agile transformation or whether it is behavioral transformation, even among people and coaching, the principle will be the same. So I'd like you to keep this visual at the back of your mind as as you listen through the remaining slides. Okay, uh, a quick overview of the agile values, uh, the manifesto. This is really the prince. Uh, this is the core of of what agile values are all about. Uh, it's, it's really the bottom of the iceberg, individual and interactions over processes and tools, uh, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan. Uh, the key operative word here is over and not instead of. So it's not, you're not replacing one over the other. You prioritize the one on the left over the one on the right. right? And, and when you have a conflict, choose the left over the right. And that's how, that's how you inform your, your judgment and decision making. Uh, I'll not spend too much time on this. I think many of you know this already. Uh, the, the crux is uh, in this slide. So as part of preparing for this, what I, what I really wanted to do is, what I tried to do is looked up all of the principles. And this is something that we live every single day. Uh, but if you look at the agile principles, you will find 12 of them. And as I, as I parse through the 12 uh, principles, uh, I realized that they fall into five broad categories. One that talks about what is delivered and measured. Right. And as part of any typical analysis, you go through a what, why, who, the, 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 the W questions. Uh, five of them address what is delivered and measured. And it talks about outcomes for agile transformation. Uh, three of them talk about who and how from a team perspective, talks about team organization and talks about the principles that drive team organization. Uh, two of them drive the, the design and adaptation. It's really more to do with how, how, how do teams execute, right? Uh, and then two of them talk about specific behaviors in terms of learning and adaptation. How do you bring the feedback cycle back? And, and there is one principle that really, in my mind, describes uh, the, the success of Agile. If you are seeing the outcome, one principle is really the description of, of what a successful Agile transformation is. So I'll go through that. You don't need to buy hard this, but I would like you to after this webinar, if you went back and really parsed through the 12 principles and put it as part of your day-to-day -day work, it will be a, a, a very beautiful sense of where true north is, right? And often in our day-to-day -day work, we forget where north is and then get distracted, right? So I'd like you to focus on that. Uh, so I'll start with each stage. I'll have two slides. The first one that describes the principles and then one where I, where I talk about the real challenges I have seen in my experience. Uh, in my organization, we had really 15 different uh, sprint teams uh, working on different products. And I, I, saw, I saw different aspects of different challenges coming up. So no one, no team represents, uh, even within an organization, you'll have different cultures, different aspects, and, and you need to work through each one of them. So this is all of what I'm talking about is the challenges I have seen. I'm pretty sure you will have also seen challenges. So I'll be happy to hear that as we, as we go to the Q&A section. Uh, so... The first one, uh, I'll quickly read through this, uh, but really uh, the, the four principles related to what is delivered and measured in any agile uh, organization or team is really about uh, satisfying the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. I think that is key. It is about the operative words I have underlined. Uh, it's about focusing on the customer and satisfying the customer and also making sure that you are delivering as early as possible continuously valuable software. The second one is really about welcoming requirement changes, uh, regardless of when it is early in the cycle, late in the cycle, doesn't matter. And you use the agile processes uh, to harness the change. Uh, and the advantage with having that feedback is now your customer is really telling you what they really want rather than what's something in their heads. It's really using the feedback of what you've already provided. It's a, it's a, it's a very, instead of resisting change, you welcome change because it's really telling you what the customer wants with real feedback. And, and that brings customers uh, the, the real competitive advantage to your customer. Uh, the third one is working software is the primary measure of progress. It, it's important to look at both words, not just software, but working software. And the last one is deliver working software frequently. Uh, and, and, and the preference is for shorter time scales. So if you have to transform, measure yourself in terms of whether you are going to 
deliver in at shorter time scales rather than longer time scales. And if you have to choose, and if you are seeing pain, uh, use the pain to inform on how you can go uh, go further left in terms of shorter time cycles. Right? Any any time you choose shorter time cycles with high quality, you will have actually delivered value to your customer. So these are the four key principles. I'll now go to the. Uh, I hope. You, you look through this, you don't need to buy hard it again. Uh, the slides will be available. You, you can go through it and any website will talk about these. Uh, but it's really uh, these slides, the, the challenges where, uh, which is what I have gained through my experience that I want to share with all of you. So three broad categories that I have seen. First one is people confuse code committed to working software, right? And it, it's very common uh developers uh, whether it is test engineers or any engineers working on the team develop, uh, when they are building capabilities people would think okay i have checked in this code right it's merged and now it must be working software so people can confuse checked in code to being working software that's not true working software is when something is actually delivered and we'll come to that in in the in the, in the next couple of verticals uh, some signs you will see is developers working on some things and once they check in say okay my job is done now it's over to qa and now test engineers qa qe it doesn't matter what you call them when the test engineers are now waiting for their turn to start on the work rather than working directly with engineers and, and then uh, and then working on the features separately working on the feature together that's when you are really making working software otherwise you are creating working code right uh, key patterns you will see is uh, one of the key things that I have seen in my experience, uh, uh, an anti-pattern is in your story definitions itself, you will see uh, as a developer, I would like to do this. As a test engineer, I would look to do this. As, as a performance test engineer, I would like to do this. Your stories themselves will be structured from different personas, which would be your internal personas. And that is a very clear sign that people are working on creating code and not software. It's, it's a very classic anti-pattern. Watch for this very commonly. I've seen it. It's a challenge. People grow through it, but then as 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 agile professionals, it's it's our duty to call those out and watch for that and help the team uh, get to the right patterns. The the other key pattern, uh, as as people can believe, is even if it is working software, uh, people would be checking it into multiple branches of code. You will have cases where you will have a large branching and. Even if there are multiple stories being worked on in parallel, each one of them will be in its own branch. Uh, they will sit on their own branch without getting merged into the main branch. So to that extent, teams will collect their story points because they will believe, oh, at the end of the sprint, I checked in, it went into my branch, it is working code. Again, it was not merged into master. It is not pushed to production. And therefore, to, some ex to that extent, you are really delivering code that is sitting on the shelf. And if you think you are delivering software sitting on the shelf and you are collecting story points uh, and calling that velocity, it's really not agile because you haven't really given it in the hands of the customer to collect any feedback. So, and anything, and the whole purpose of agile is to reduce your inventory, right? And you will see that in a later slide. And any software that is not delivered to the customer is inventory and is losing its value because the customer hasn't seen it. It's a very classic anti-pattern, uh, important to watch again. Uh, and and I, I strongly encourage everyone to watch that very carefully. The third anti-pattern would be large epics and the struggle to define what is the minimum valuable, value, minimum valuable product. Uh, and and that, that's a very key anti-pattern. Uh, in any team where you've got uh, engineers and product owners and product managers, uh, you would see constant challenge in terms of being able to break things down into smaller stories. And even if when you create a lot of smart, small stories, it's really saying, what is the MVP? When do I know or what time do I decide that this is good enough? And, and that's where it becomes a standard, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a very typical tug of war where product management is trying to increase scope, engineers are trying to reduce scope and nobody can agree, right? And, but, and oftentimes teams don't engage with each other. They tend to work in silos. Uh, engineering leaders would say, oh, you know what, POs, you guys decide it and whatever it is, we will build it. And again, that's when you look at POs as another department, instead of collaborating and building an art, working together with the POs and the product management team uh, or with the business analyst team, depending on what type of organization it is, that engineering team, when they work with the business leaders, that's an, an engage in terms of figuring out how do you get to the MVP? Engage, debate, right? And if it means have heated debates, get data, 
But as long as you're not seeing that, you're fooling yourself into believing that you'll get successful agile. You can follow all the processes, but you won't have agile unless you get into the habit of identifying MVP. Uh, I'll pause here. Uh, Priyank, let's see if there are any questions. Um, maybe give two minutes for any questions. I'll answer them and then we'll, I'll move on to the next topic. Uh, there is one question, uh, Suresh, I can read it out. How do yeah. we apply Agile, its values and principles to a non-R&D team? We are focusing on culture of R&D team, but when you look at organizational transformation, R&D is not the only department. Are we going to cover these topics in future slides? My, my, my experience is primarily from R&D, but I think what I would like you, the way I would like to think about is uh, look at the principles and apply change, right? Uh, and even if you're not in R&D, you are really solving problems. I mean, at the end of the day, all teams are trying to solve problems. And if you're trying to solve problems, uh, the, the similar patterns here would be, if you're not talking to your stakeholder, if you do not, if your stakeholder is waiting long periods of time, say months before a piece of work that you as a team is delivering, uh, right? And it is remaining within the enterprise and not outside and your stake and your end customer is not seeing it. Delivering to your stakeholder doesn't mean anything. Your end customers must see it. And as long as you are pivoting in that direction, you are being agile. Whether it is R&D or any other organization, uh, focusing on time and, and, and making sure that you, you can get them to the smallest piece that will give you as early feedback as possible. Those would be the patterns I would think. Any other questions? Yeah, but my narrative is fundamentally uh, from an R&D context, but I would think if, if you really peel the layers of the onion, uh, you can you can build context for non R&D organizations also. That's the only question so far. Okay. All right. I, I will. Good. Great question. Thank you. Uh, next topic is really about who and how. I mean, what do the what does the what do the principles talk about? Who and how of teams? It's really about business people and developers working together throughout the project. This is very key. Again, all the three words are important. Working of developers and business people throughout the project, not at any one stage or the other one. Building projects around motivated individuals, that's again very key. Uh, and if you get Agile right, you will realize that your team is on a consistent, regular pattern of increasing motivation. If your motivation levels are down, something is wrong with your Agile implementation. Uh, so building projects around motivated individuals and giving them an environment and support uh, so that it's fundamentally about trust, assuming that you have to trust the team that they will get the job done. And there are, this is an area that's really hard to get uh, and we'll talk about in the challenges. Uh, and then the, the, the other one is really the most efficient and effective method of conveying information is face-to-face -face conversation. Again, uh, not everybody needs to be the same geography. It's really about uh, not writing emails. It's really about having face-to-face -face communication as much as possible with or without a mask uh, on a video call any which way, but really about is about engaging conversation and not, uh, not waiting for, for approvals and, and long, uh, long, 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 uh, you know, process cycles where you're waiting for, for, for feedback. Those are the key uh, principles around team organization, uh, hard ones, uh, but uh, if you get these right, of all the four, I think this this one and the next one are the really hard ones to get, and we will focus uh, some of those topics here. Uh, so the first one, uh, first anti-pattern, sorry, uh, as you can see, is uh, leads and managers, uh, team members are effectively waiting or, or they're using leads and managers as conduits to communicate with the business or, or the POs or the PM. It's a very classic anti-pattern. Uh, where and all of the examples I'm talking about is when you when you go from command and control vertically oriented organizations. If you see the visual on the left, command and control org structures are are top to bottom, and and when you try to follow the communication channels that is going top to bottom and then work on agile with that, uh, you get into all these troubles, uh, and that's where you will see classic patterns where team members are saying, okay, Mr. Lead or Mr. Manager, can you give me uh, can you can you help talk to PO tomorrow and tell me what he really he or she implied by this requirement? That's a classic anti-pattern, and that implies that engineers are not engineers who are working the product. Engineers who are actually working on the thing do not have the courage, or the culture is not right where there is open communication. That's it's a very classic anti-pattern. Uh, sizing is given to the team by seniors. Again, 
the whole idea of playing uh, of of the the poker methods or any of the sizing methods that you do in agile is about having everybody a say in terms of figuring out what from their perspective they are seeing in terms of sizing and then getting the right answer again there is there is never a perfect answer there is only a, the best possible answer that's the whole thing about estimation but as long as the team is engaging in their sizing there will be commitment to that and as long as seniors or quote unquote seniors are giving the sizing to the team saying i think it should be eight story point and then that is taken as gospel you see that there is a cultural gap right it needs to be a, a collective decision uh, teams focus on meeting numbers and this is a very classic pattern uh, there would because any any system any organization is really about measurements and it's very easy to fall into the trap where either as scrum masters you are saying okay what should the burn down look like what is the velocity of the team and then you say oh this term uh, you start playing numbers where you say if my velocity is 25 uh, somebody makes a mandate that next quarter we should have our velocity go up to 30 or my my burn down is looking too staggered uh, it's looking like a step function i need a smooth function all of these the moment you start putting these as important patterns for the team to follow you will get exactly the wrong behaviors where now the team is now working towards meeting those numbers and they forget about talking to the real stakeholders and the stakeholders in a product organization would be production talking to customer services talking to the operations folks talking to the field services Uh, the, the example from from the question would be if 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 you're not an r&d organization even if let's say you are a support organization you're not talking to your customer right not to your i mean you are in, getting informed by your eventual end customer and that's when you really get feedback uh, and that's very important because without that you are satisfying somebody else and that's the uh, other than your customer and and that's that's the exact opposite of what agile folk, uh, pushes us to do the the other anti pattern i have seen very common is uh, managers managers in the command and control structure feeling loss of control uh, a classic example would be i am losing control of my team i don't know what they are doing i don't know they don't listen to me anymore i don't feel uh, you know so there's nobody to manage uh, in fact if you are getting your managers to be uncomfortable with this then you have got good agile implementation right uh, if your team is doing it right and your manager is wondering you've got it right if if no if everybody is looking upwards for guidance then you've got a wrong implementation uh, so this is a very classic one uh, i i'd strongly advise everybody to watch for it uh, another one uh, is is a, is is a classic one uh, and this typically happens in organizations where you've got people looking upwards uh, exec teams will want productivity metrics Uh, any agile transformation people want to say oh i've spent so much money on agile transformation there are 55 coaches we have hired how have we increased our productivity uh, you'd end up producing lots of productivity metrics how many lines of code have been written how many test metrics have test metrics all kinds of metrics you're producing to justify agile transformation and then you produce large status reports uh, that are constructed these are your classic program management red amber green type reports on status of a project again very classic patterns that the more you fall into the trap you, you you will be you will be playing you will it look as if you are doing agile you will have all of the rituals but the spirit will not be there right uh, the the key things that i have learned from my experience is if you are agile and you truly agile the alignment to your goals uh, and the sprint burn downs uh, as scrum masters or, or product owners or even engineering leaders you should be able to derive your alignment Uh, through the sprint burn down itself if you are having to construct reports then i think you've got something wrong uh, and, and again constantly keep watching on what are you reporting on are you reporting on outputs or are you reporting on outcomes right and it's it's very easy to confuse between those two and in if you look at the whole agile principle you are constantly focusing on outcomes you really never worry about outputs because if you're it doesn't matter what outputs you do if you don't meet the outcomes because that's actually of no use you you're actually burning money right uh, so these are all the typical command and control anti patterns the one anti pattern i saw once you once you get to a to a real agile team is the opposite where now you don't have the notion of managers command and control is not there everybody is now peer accountable but with peer accountability uh, people start confusing peer accountability to democracy where you are now thinking oh you know what i cannot be i cannot say some idea is good or bad uh, that's because then then it's not it's not set team self organizing 
that's not true you need to have healthy debates and eventually the decision making is by the best idea winning it, the team needs to have an environment of trust where they can come up with ideas and be confident that the best idea will win it doesn't matter who brings it and as long as we have a culture uh, of the best idea winning right regardless of who it comes from then you have got the right team organization uh, democracy will never work uh, if you do a vote on which is the best idea it's probably the worst thing you can do uh, it, it, the, the best ideas will typically stand out and it won't be democratic so that those were my uh, my observations uh, i think all of, i've seen all of them occur in one team or the other over the several years of agile transformation i've seen and every time i i saw one of them i could see the teams go to the next level and, and uh, get that was more joy out of the agile transformation uh i'll pause for questions uh, we have one question already um, okay suresh yeah uh, how do we plan for horizontal team into agile as they are working with multiple teams or parallel sprints uh, maybe they are looking at someone uh, who's a systems team maybe or an it team that supports multiple other teams well uh, if it is if it is a ticketing based thing if you're if you're talking about a team that is operating out of tickets that is coming in from the outside for example if it's an it team that's getting tickets that's a slightly different problem because you're you're really not it's it's a request response system right uh, it's 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 you are you are to that extent uh, that's not as much of a problem because you you don't need you need you don't need the agility of the of the kinds i am talking about uh, for those kind of teams it will really be about what are your internal projects if you are if you are changing some methods if you are changing the uh, philosophy of how you are meeting your customer needs Uh, if you are an it team and you are saying i need to modify my ticketing system itself when you are executing on those projects how would i be agile about it instead of waiting for 6 months to deliver can i do it in small iterations that would be the example i would use uh, but if you have product teams and you have got uh, people working across multiple organizations uh, i would like i would request you to wait for my next slide uh, i have got some inputs there on how you and when you have those kind of problems where there are certain people who are catering to multiple vertical organizations to deliver value uh, i think it does tell you that you've got some challenges with respect to organization design and uh, in order to get correct agile implementation you might have to influence the organization design itself i personally went through that uh, and we will talk about it in the next next few slides thanks suresh Great. one more question uh, that has come uh what are the best methods to apply agile to it infra projects any pointers like i said again for it infra projects if it is ticketing based don't worry about being too agile but if you are talking about uh, infrastructure projects where you are trying to uh, do a full design and 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 build bring in changes for your customers or internal whether it's internal or external uh, i think it's again focus on the the first one saying how do you define your mvp don't try to figure out all the answers up front uh, can you can you break it down into smaller stories work with your stakeholders negotiate and figure out how you can get early feedback right again it's eventually about doing it in small cycles the shorter the better that would be my uh, input again i'll be honest i haven't personally worked on it transformation but these are principles if it works for the part where agile works best is uh, where things are very if you can change something quickly uh, that's where you should apply agile if something is very expensive to change right once you have gotten uh, if it's hardware you will need to be a little careful trying to be uh, trying to apply continuous delivery and deployment because then you have you have got some costs uh, but if the if the cost of change like software is near zero you are better off being as agile as possible get as feed do whatever you can to reduce your feedback cycle and again the next two slides really talk about that i i guess those are all the questions we had so far sorish all right uh, one more came in just now shall i read it out yeah, yeah, okay uh, is agile customer centric or only focus on productivity because r and d team never talks directly to customers okay wow that's a <laughs> if if r and d teams do not talk to the customers or the proxies to the customer then something is wrong right so it agile should never be about productivity agile should be about velocity and the difference between productivity and velocity is 
productivity is uh, you know you you are always doing proxy metrics uh, number of lines of code you wrote how many hours you work those are the productivity metrics but it's of no use if you are not delivering value to your customer right and therefore you are that's why you you do story points you you try to break it down into stories and those stories need to reflect business value right and if you are able to deliver those business value the only person who can tell you whether it delivered business value is your customer right asking your your proxy it, the product owner will tell you yes i think it it creates value you can satisfy that but if you are not further watching what happened to that feature did it actually get used what metrics do i have to say on the utilization of that particular feature then i think you're not agile enough so looking at the customer and stakeholder in terms of the the in terms of actual usage and if for example you delivered a feature and nobody used it for 6 months the question is what are you going to do with it would you rather knock off all the code because you are building debt now you are you are making your code large with no additional value so it might actually be cheaper for you to just drop that code from your code base make it lighter why maintain it so that would be my example okay i'll move on i think i have got 15 more minutes priyank so I'll yeah go. yeah uh okay this one is is a very interesting one i hope this one will address some of the questions that came uh, uh it's really about design uh how do you do the right designs in an agile context so the the first one is 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 very deep it's uh, it's very profound philosophical uh, it's about simplicity and the the you are doing agile the purpose of doing agile is to maximizing the amount of work not done right and that would imply this is really another way of saying just in time do the work as late as possible with as much information that you know at that point in time right so the sh the, the shorter your time horizon of knowledge to reality the better you are because that's how you 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 respond to the market and if if you if you have shorter feedback cycles uh, you can actually pivot quickly uh, from a product design angle or from any angle and say use the feedback to change your path right and you're not over designing and it keeps your design simple uh, it, it it has worked in our case uh, i mean i saw multiple examples where keeping things into a short time horizon prevented us from over designing the system and every time we over design we realized that we were actually assuming problems that never existed in the market right so so it's a, it's a very very useful and and deep principle um, and then continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility again people think that if you're designing for short time horizons you're not uh, you're not doing the right thing you're, you're being lazy but it's important to be it, it's important to have technical excellence you're not over designing but doing the right designs you you right size the design to the problems you're trying to solve right you're not trying to solve for problems that you do not know exist in your business so you you to that extent you're agile right whatever problems you are able to anticipate you design for them and if you haven't anticipated them be future proof but not so future proof that you are being paranoid right so it's these are all hard judgments uh, but focusing on the principles helps you take the right judgment on whether you are you are falling into the trap of big design up front which i will talk about in the next slide uh, so this slide is all about conway's law and i think uh, there's a question that somebody was asking uh, i will address it here but uh, i'll go through the slide points and then i'll i'll get to the organization design part on the third or fourth bullet uh from a from a team perspective from a design angle uh, the, the biggest challenge would be uh, it's a, it's a it's a corollary of the first principle where where you had you you struggle to define mvp uh, pms and developers would typically have very large planning you're trying to plan a whole quarter in advance you're trying to do all of the sizing for everything you're trying to make sure that the architecture that you're defining or the design you are working is for the whole quarter for all stories uh, that would be a huge overhead in terms of trying to figure out at the beginning of the quarter every single design uh, you will need to have rough designs for what you uh, what you broadly looking at but then for the stories that you already have in your backlog that is shallow you should have really solid designs so focusing on that uh, really helps uh, and keeps your uh, time horizon really short uh, the other typical problem would be uh, exec pressure where you have uh, marketing you have got sales you have got product design you have got sec ops you've got operations everybody is saying i have got something in your backlog and you try to keep everybody happy uh, the reality is you will never be able to keep everybody happy right what is important is not to keep your internal stakeholders happy 
how do you make sure that you are able to work on the most important priorities and at some point you will need to take a call on this quarter or this month and in this product iteration i'm going to work on the most important ones and if that means some things will have to be given up so be it and that's where you will need to have the courage to work with your business teams and say stand up and tell the teams wait for the right turn because as long as the priority is right the team will work on the most important ones otherwise you run into the problem of teams becoming arbitrarily large right if you if you get to the point where you are trying to trying to keep everybody happy you will get to a point where every every quarter or every six months you are adding more people to the team and and adding more to the team does not help it actually reverses the problem it makes the problem worse so from a product design perspective uh, you know you will need to make hard decisions on whom to satisfy and which are the most important you're not talking about who is the most important stakeholder you are asking which is the most important business priority right and if the stakeholder is not is not able to justify why that particular feature is not important then i think something else will be right and again it goes back into confidence it it goes back into value and and it, it, there's no insult that somebody's work is not getting taken up right and that's that's very key it's it's a it's a cultural thing uh, the 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 other one is uh, is uh, it, it's typical uh, architects and engineers they love to you know define their own work in their own silo you keep you, you keep designing for the future two years out or one and a half years out and they 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 cannot start until they know everything it's a typical big design of french syndrome uh, watching for that and and trying to push the teams uh, into into designing for what they already know and then working from there uh, is, is a better approach uh, i i I'd, i'd like to talk about conway's law it's it's a very uh, it's a very beautiful philosophy i've seen it work uh, in my organization uh, and i have some literature that you should be reading uh, i'll i'll point to that at the end but it's really about Uh, any organization will design a system uh, that reflects the communication structure i think somebody was asking if your team ha- if your if your team or organization structure is i have got a team of app developers i have a team of back end developers i have a team of deep, uh, database designers i have got a team of infrastructure people and devops people and they have their own teams uh, and and software gets delivered from left to right uh, or each of these are working on their own backlogs uh, then you will have a case where each team will design to optimize for their own work right and the challenge will be your design will reflect your org structure right and if you really think about it the designs that you will come up with you and if you have got four or five people in each now you'll say how do i keep my four people busy you will invent requirements to keep your five people busy or 10 people busy that's the exact opposite of what you're trying to do the goal of agile is not to keep your people busy the goal of agile is to make sure that your people are busy working on business requirements that are actually going to get delivered so if you have an organization like this you are better off really thinking about can you change your org design to have people from these teams organized in the same sprint and that's where the whole two pizza rule uh, the, the 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 organization design of having cross functional teams working on agile Uh, that's what works best it is challenging it is painful but that will be the right thing to do uh questions yes suresh there is one question yeah uh stakeholders always ask for an estimate or delivery date even before teams start development how do we cater to them with short planning and commit horizon so i'm assuming that if your stake if if they are asking for a uh, for something in the current quarter right you saying okay you are doing quarterly planning right i'm assuming most organize i mean for the good part i think if you if you can look up one quarter ahead i think you have a good chance uh, and that's where i think having that that initial uh, discussion with the stakeholders creating the key goals for the quarter right working towards the key goals for the quarter and make and again as long as you are not trying to satisfy everybody it is a matter of businesses sitting down together and saying which are the most important things right uh, and it could be driven and and that's where you also need to figure out okay do you carry a lot of debt what are the things that are going to hold you back right uh, so it's at some point you will have you may have to say no uh, and if you don't have the courage to say no you will never succeed right uh, but it is about but if you have got reasonable planning done 
uh, you're not trying to commit to the full scope of everything. What you're really doing is negotiate on the scope as you are working on time, right? And that's where the creativity of working on the stories and working on the MVP comes. Business is not, for the most part, business is saying, give me a feature. They're not saying, they're saying, give me this business value. Problem is teams typically assume that I need to now deliver on every single thing the business is asking. That's not what the business is saying. You can go back and say, this is what you're asking for. And this is the amount of resources I have. Can I find a creative way in which I can satisfy your requirement? Right. And you, and if the business teams cannot come up with an MVP, then you can challenge back saying, if you cannot come with an MVP, I'm not building it. Right. And that comes from courage to engage. And, and once you start engaging, you will realize that people can negotiate, figure out why you are building a feature. Right. As long as you are stuck in the what and the how, you will not be able to engage. But if you can ask the question, why am I building this feature? What is the business value? You will realize that you can negotiate. It's never an easy conversation, but having those uh, heated debates, not arguments, heated debates in terms of business value is the only way you can you can answer those questions. But I think if you have if you have a good, that's why it goes back into that culture of trust. If the if the team has trust that the team is actually creating value, they are focusing on the customer, uh, then then it typically gets becomes easier over time. It will never be comfortable. It will become easier. You will always have debates. There's no doubt about it. So it's another question. Yeah. How do we know if the team size is right? How do we know if we need to add more people or downsize? Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, if there is no right or wrong team size, but if the team size, I mean, my thumb rule would be uh, the, the Amazon example, the two pizza rule is a, is a very good thumb rule. If And we saw that very easily. The moment you start going beyond a team size of a sprint team, right? Not an organization. If you have a product and in that product, you've got 50 people. My team had 70 people. Uh, I could not have possibly created one sprint team. But you need to then, that's where there are very nice examples of microservices, domain-driven design, uh, do understanding your, 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 your event flow. And creatively come up with the boundaries where you can create your independent sprint teams or, or, or groups of people that are working on those capabilities. If you exceed 15 or 15 in a sprint, you're already in trouble. Uh, you will need to somehow, somehow figure out how to break it down. I have never seen, uh, we tried uh, in, in full hardiness, uh, getting up to 20. Uh, my experience was the moment we started going beyond 15, the amount of cross uh, noise that the team needs to now work with each other to get your feature done. Uh, it's so large that, 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 that you really cannot deliver anything. There is always some debt remaining and you, your team can't deliver at the end of the sprint. Uh, and then if your team becomes that large, then you end up having very large sprint, sprint, uh, sprint uh, durations. People will say, oh, you know, I'm going to take a month to define a sprint. And those, those typically start becoming problems. So, so the right, so I would say if you're, Thumb rules, uh, these are not, again, not uh, hardcore, uh, th these are not hardwired. If you're going beyond a team of 15, you're already becoming too large for a sprint team. If you have a product that is a large group that is catering to multiple functions as sub functions, uh, look at trying to creatively break down your product into uh, look, up, look up microservices design, anything to do with domain driven design and refactor your product in a manner that you can construct small sprint teams. Uh, there is no such thing as very small team. Uh, if, if you think a, a sprint team needs to be two people, so be it. There's no such thing as a very small sprint team, provided they are creating business value. I had I had examples where I had two member sprint teams. It worked perfectly fine, no problem. So is there is one more question. Uh, can we consider it as a final one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so in Agile, uh, are considering every team are working on their own user stories, who should be doing the integration, end-to-end -end integration testing? Uh, do you recommend a separate integration no, team? I would not do that. The team needs to do the integration testing. Yeah, Se having a separate integration testing team is, is already trouble. You will need to do integration testing within the team, within the sprint. It's hard, but it will be done that way. And, and and once you make that a goal, automation automatically becomes important, and that forces automation. So, without 
application, you cannot drive a higher velocity. So that's where you see Agile will automatically end up uh, driving automation. I mean, if sooner than later, you will get to that point. Uh, I mean, it's not as if you need to force it. If, if you have a lot of manual testing, you could possibly to start with create a separate agile, uh, integration testing phase. You could do that, uh, but the sh but you need to constantly keep watching for how long you're doing that. If that in itself is, is, is two sprints long, then something is wrong. Then you probably got too, too bigger, then, then your stories are too large. So you, you can keep it as part of transitioning, but eventually you will need to trend towards doing it within the sprint. So it's not bad. It is just something that you need to focus on and, and drive it downwards. Measure it and drive it downwards. That would be my, my guidance. Okay, I will move to the next one. Uh, and then we have some time left at the end for more questions. But again, I'm very happy with the questions. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, behaviors, this one is the very important one, uh, learning and adaptation. This is the whole principle of agile at regular intervals. Uh, the team reflects on how, uh, how to become effective, tune and adjust their behavior accordingly. This is the whole uh, idea around uh, retrospectives. And then the best architectures and requirements come from self-organizing teams. And these are both very important because eventually it is the team that looks for feedback, right? And based on the feedback, you are figuring out your debt, uh, you're learning from your mistakes and then fixing it, right? And that's, that's the best learning. Uh, and, and those behaviors, uh, some of the challenges you will see typically is, uh, uh, I'm sure many scrum masters and team leaders would see uh, ineff ineffective retrospectives. Uh, very common uh, things transitioning from command and control systems to, to an agile environment where people want to hear good, only good news, right? And, and typically what would happen is when teams are convincingly telling you something is going wrong, uh, teams uh, incompetence. Uh, that's, that's the exact opposite of servant leadership. Uh, uh, Agile requires servant leadership where the people like whether it is scrum masters or, or people leaders or, or technology leaders, architects, they need to be working with the team to unblock the team and, and get solving those problems that the team is bringing up. That's what creates an environment of trust. And, and as long as the team is, until the team is able to bring them up in the retrospectives freely, uh, you know, you haven't, got, you haven't got your Agile culture right. Uh, the other one is leadership is directing instead of listening and coaching. It's again the fundamental of uh, that's why you don't. That's why the whole notion of agile coaches, your, your people managers and your leaders become coaches. They don't manage, they coach, they guide. Uh, they don't, they don't, they don't direct and say do it this way. Even if they have to do it, they work with the team and solve the problems by themselves, uh, working shoulder to shoulder. So the whole culture of the team changes by virtue of bringing in servant leadership. It's a very important aspect, uh, hard to do, but is important to get your agile culture right. Uh, the other one is KPIs. Uh, typically, uh, in your retrospectives, uh, what are the KPIs that you're measuring? And uh, not measuring, typically, you teams end up measuring the wrong things or they don't measure enough. Uh, but this is where, again, whether you are measuring for productivity or whether you are measuring for velocity and outcomes, that is key, right? And once you start measuring them, uh, looking at the stakeholders and learning from them become more important. If you keep working on productivity, the problem is you're working on a, on a proxy, right? And it's very easy to start gaming the system. Uh, I can write 400 lines of code that doesn't produce any value, right? But then I've got my checkbox. So uh, looking at outcomes is the best way to bring in the right culture of, of delivering business value. Uh, so watch your KPIs and, and uh, as Scrum Masters or people working on the agile uh, domain, uh, the, 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 the more KPIs you are that are driving value, um, it'll help. I've got some very good literature at the end of the slide deck that talks about how to design them. Uh, you should be able to read those books to get that value. Uh, people managers, again, this is a very classic uh, behavior challenge. Uh, avoiding people challenges because you're saying self-organized teams, you don't focus on, on incorrect behaviors in the team. Uh, and if you do not, uh, uh, this is a specific example go, goes to people, people leaders in the team, uh, people who have vertical ownership of people members. Uh, if you're not watching for the right behaviors and if you do not call out the incorrect behaviors, uh, you need to reward the good behaviors, penalize the bad behaviors. So self-organizing does not mean that you tolerate incorrect behavior. You will need to pull that up, right? Uh, and if you do not pull that up, gravity will move towards the average, right? And, and once you start seeing that, there is no way agile will help the you cannot influence 
a high velocity by having average team behaviors and the, the important thing is once you once you look at that and bring take the people who, who bring the team energy down or, or bringing things down uh, you will see that the that the team then start saying oh this now i'm i'm peer accountable to people who are who are high value right so the team self corrects it it naturally starts moving towards high delivery value it's not as if teams will start working 16 hours a day they will produce more value in the 9 hours they work right and that's i have seen that happen it's a hard thing to do uh, but again something that that needs to be watched from a culture angle and it's most important like i was saying earlier uh, supporting the team to take risks it's again uh, if you want to meet your uh, if you want to meet all your story points uh, week after week and sprint after sprint and get 100% you will have zero risk but you will have nothing to improve right so taking risks learning to fail adapting and then improving continuously that i think is the whole purpose of having retrospectives take risks learn talk to your stakeholders and then bring the feedback and then if you are measuring things use them to to inform you uh, and then make them kpis uh, don't make them productivity metrics uh, again a few more questions and then i'll go to the last slide okay looks like there's nothing priya yeah yeah okay. all right it was either too dense or, or maybe i went too fast so <laughs> <laughs> on both cases i'm sorry if i did but uh, to everyone on this call this is a very important area the, the feedback cycle the whole reason why you have short feedback cycles is to focus on the retrospectives and, and the sooner you and and that's why i think this is a very important slide uh, these principles are key and and watching these leads to very dramatic improvement in agile transformation the last one is really a principle but then i would say if your agile uh, methodology whatever you have applied if your culture is right and if your methods are right you will end up with a pro you will have end up promoting sustainable development where your sponsors uh, your developers and the users are able to maintain constant pace indefinitely and this is where i was saying you are not going to burn out your team because you are not increasing productivity by adding more hours you are adding more effectiveness by working on the right things right at the right time that's how agile works right so continuous improvement does not mean linearly increasing the 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 the, the velocity that's not what it means what it means in terms of continuous improvement is you are constantly learning adapting to the market and providing the best value that your business needs at that point in time right and you are constantly learning so people often get scared of continuous improvement oh but if i did 80 lines of code how am i going to write 90 lines of code i mean if you look at it if you look at it like that you will never succeed right but if you looked at how did i be, do what 90 lines of code did i write right did i did i make those 90 lines of code useful maybe i should have done 45 lines of code and still been as effective that is improvement right same with testing same with performance uh, you know so so using that in a, in a manner that is sustainable and doing it indefinitely is the bus final business value of agile so this is the last one there's nothing to there's no anti pattern here uh, this is really the pattern if you follow all the remaining 11 correctly this will be the end result okay uh, a few books that i uh, have found incredibly useful uh, i have used it in my uh, in my uh, in my real uh, Uh, in my real life uh, in terms of watching for these anti patterns fixing them at various points in time accelerate uh, i think many people have been asking for what to measure uh, just look up this book uh, it says devops but regardless of what type of organization you are watch for patterns around what to measure when to measure and and, and the wrong things uh, this is a, this is a beautiful book uh, highly recommended for any team uh, doing high velocity agile transformations uh, the second one is really about it's a very nice book that talks about uh, the the scaling agile uh, in really complex organizations uh, very good uh, case studies from hp's example uh, i found this book particularly useful i would highly recommend people to read this uh, the the one on the extreme right team topologies this is the one that has very beautiful ideas on uh, the conway's law it introduces conway's law as a principle and how uh, incorrect uh, incorrect organization design leads to siloed execution and how it it, it basically impacts or, or or creates challenges in the flow of your of your delivery it's a very beautiful book uh, uh, there are much more complex books to read but this one is relatively it is it is not easy read it is difficult 
but not theoretical. It's very practical. I, I would strongly recommend people to read this. Uh, the, the book actually picks up a lot of inputs from the from Accelerate. So somehow all these three books uh, work with each other. They, they kind of are, are an interesting triumvirate uh, that, that talks about the same things from different points of view. Uh, strongly recommend you pick these up and, uh, and work with your leadership teams. Uh, again, uh, Priyank, I don't know if there are any more questions. Uh, yes, there, are, there are a couple of questions now that came in. Okay. Uh, like uh, you know, people are really interested to know your thoughts on many things. Sure. Uh, since we have reached the end of the time, uh, what I would uh, what I would want to ask uh, the participants is, uh, if you want to drop off, feel free. Uh, we will take quick two to three minutes to answer the few set of questions that have come in, and then we will wind up this webinar. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of you that want to drop off, you know, thank you for joining. Uh, Suresh, I'll quickly read out the two yeah. questions. Okay. Before I end, uh, and if, if these questions are, are very valuable to you, uh, there was a slide at the beginning. Feel free to send me an email. I'll be more than happy to get in touch with you and respond. Right. Yeah. So the question is, uh, this is a little bigger question. How do you scale Agile when multiple teams need to collaborate towards a common goal? Would the 12 Agile principles work as is? If yes, why do we have so many scale agile frameworks like safe, less, et cetera? <laughs> no, then what are your thoughts on the numerous scale agile frameworks that exist today? Okay. Uh, I, I have not, I'm not a, I have not, I would not say you need scale agile to scale, uh, right? Uh, you can scale by getting the right organization design, right? Uh, scale agile frameworks, I'm not saying that scale agile frameworks are wrong. I'm not passing a judgment. What I'm saying is you don't need scaled agile if your organization is large. You can do, uh, if you if you have the right, and that's why I'm saying, look up the three books uh, that I mentioned. If you have your right principles, uh, the principles do not tell you whether you need safe or, or whether you need uh, scrum or whether you need Kanban. The principles operate at a more philosophical level, uh, but scaled agile is, are again methodologies. Right, they're like Scrum. How do you take multiple Scrum teams to work with each other? So each of them have different ways and means of uh, aggregating information. How do you do your uh, quarterly planning or annual planning? There are again methods of structuring the flow of communication back and forth in your organization. Uh, there's nothing you could you can apply scaled agile as long as you are following the principle. Right. So again, uh, you can if your scaled agile implementation is such that you are having long release cycles. Your, your, your teams are working in siloed environments. They are delivering to your, they are not delivering to the stakeholder, but, but looking inwards rather than outwards. Those would be the cases where then you know that scaled agile is, a, is, is an excuse for being waterfall, right? Uh, so it, it, is a hard, it is a hard decision, uh, but if you watch your principles, you will get scaled agile, right? Uh, but I would not say that you need scaled agile for large organizations. We were able, I mean, in my company, I mean, we had, I had remember, I had a team of 70. We also had an ops team of about 35 people, a hundred member organization. We did not require scaled agile. Just by getting the organization design right, uh, changing the design structure, organizing the teams as cross-functional uh, actually got us the velocity improvement that we needed. Yeah, I was, I mean, personally, I was not a big fan of scaled agile, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't work. So there are two more questions. Yeah. Uh, how do you do knowledge management in agile teams in case someone leaves the organization? Mm -hmm. I think that's where uh, the knowledge management is coming, okay. coming from. Uh, typically, I mean, that's, that's always going to be a challenge. Uh, agile doesn't solve the problem by having any specific practices, but typically what would happen is uh, by virtue of having cross-functional teams, uh, you would typically have some somebody or the other pick things up. It is possible that once somebody critical leaves, uh, you will have a drop in some velocity, uh, but it's fine. I think that is something that the team should be open to talk about with the retrospective. There is no shame in that, right? Uh, so as long as you are open about it and say, okay, here's the knowledge uh, you cannot, I mean, there, there will always be some knowledge that will be documented. Some will be, some cannot be documented. If, you're, if your principal engineer leaves, there will be an impact. Uh, you will need to find a way to backfill, uh, promote from inside. Those are typical management challenges. Uh, but if, if your team is cross-functional, you will typically see that 
by not by design but by habit of constant communication there will be people who will pick up the pick up the thread uh, it may not be exactly how it was before but if you, if you if you trust a team and the team is really tightly cohesive you will see that some new leaders will emerge uh, i did see that in my teams uh, people left uh, it you you take a hit for the next probably a couple of more iterations but you will find new leadership emerge uh, you will surprise yourself so don't try to manage it you will have to take a leap of faith uh, but if you if you have the team right team design and the right culture uh, knowledge management takes care of itself uh, but of course it is important for teams to document their designs uh, all of that still needs to happen uh, you you need to document it you need to debate the designs that's the best way to do knowledge management debate the designs right and it doesn't matter whether the architect made the design or an uh, or a uh, level 3 engineer did the design debate it and that debate will make sure knowledge management happens because people are discussing learning from the critique of those designs or architectures or implementations all right so there are no more questions uh, suresh uh, uh, on behalf of all the participants uh, i thank you for this uh, wonderful session very insightful and uh, uh for those of you who 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 had to drop out a little early or maybe some of them who had registered but could not attend we will anyways be uh sharing the recording of the webinar uh, you could you could uh, hear it again at your leisure and that will be sent out via email uh suresh there's also one more uh, uh feedback capturing uh, mechanism that that we would want to let everybody know okay. uh, there will be a survey link uh, sent out to you uh request all of you to you know uh, take your time and uh, uh, put your feedback there it it really helps us and also suresh will be keenly looking forward to right. hearing, hearing from you regarding the feedback yes yeah in, in true agile style i need my retrospective and i would definitely want to see how i did with my stakeholders which is you so, <laughs> thanks for spending your time uh, i hope it was useful and uh, i look forward to hearing from you and learning from you yeah Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Thank uh, you everyone. everyone for coming in.